my friend, my name is Terry Petrovic, and for the past 25 years, I've been teaching, coaching, and training people on how to create a better quality of life, primarily through the network marketing profession. You know, today I live a lifestyle that most people could only dream about, but I have to tell you, it hasn't always been that easy for me. You see, I believe creating success and prosperity has a lot to do with our philosophies, our programming at the conscious and subconscious level, and the truth is... The truth is, from time to time, we need to get some advice from people outside of ourselves who actually have done what we want to do. My question for you is, why is it that some people in your company uh, or whatever it is that you do have massive success relatively quickly and you might be struggling? Why is it that some people create success and other people struggle? Well, I've created this series and it's called Prosperity and the Mentors. And you're gonna be learning from some of the best people on the planet in terms of how they were able to create prosperity, abundance, what philosophies did they use to create it, how did they deal with the challenging times, and how did they create success and overall happiness in their life? Well, my guest today has been dubbed the godmother of attraction marketing uh, for her pioneering work on how to attract customers and prospects to your businesses. Without a doubt, she has impacted tens of thousands of people around the world from beginner entrepreneurs all the way up to CEOs. Her reports have been read by over 400,000 people worldwide, and she's helped people earn six, seven, and even eight-figure incomes. In the e-commerce space, she's developed multiple training courses and membership sites and workshops, and she does it for one specific reason, and that is to help her students create success at every possible level. You see, you and I have different levels of success. What that means, well, she actually works with people to help them create that level of success. Her and her team have created dozens of workshops, hands-on workshops across the country, even gone to China at the Canton Fair, which is the largest trade show in the world. But what makes her training especially, I think, unique and uh, is her, her emphasis on help and be helped. It's a community that really helps people um, level up their game, have accountability, have systems in place, have the ability to develop leaders. And she's absolutely done leadership development and help people create the quality of life that they want. My guest today is Ann Sieg. Ann, thanks so much for being here. Hey, great to be here with you, Terry. I'm excited to dialogue over this all important topic. Yeah. You know, you've had an interesting story. I've watched you for a long, long time. You've, you've truly impacted millions of people around the world with your messages and just who you are and how you show up. Um, give our viewers and readers a little bit of background on your story, where you came from, and how you got into this place where you are today, Ann. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, you know, I guess I'll take it as far back as even childhood because that's where I developed attributes that I can look back at that helped. They were like these core um, integral components of my being that uh, made a big difference in my outcome. Um, and they're, they're kind of things that you wouldn't normally think of as being a success driver. But I do think sometimes having adverse conditions in our life, of course, depending on how we deal with those adverse conditions, um, actually can be used as motivators to create a, a positive outcome. So it's going to sound kind of weird, but um, so I was a skinny, chronic, pardon me, a skinny, scrawny kid, and, and I got teased for it, and I know people go, really? How could you get teased for being skinny and scrawny? Well, it happens. I know. <laughs> I can vouch for it. it. It's not just in the other end of the spectrum that people get teased, but um, anyways, an outcome out of that, while I felt so like inferior for that and getting teased, um, then it was kind of like this little godsend of being exposed to the sport of gymnastics as a child, most notably through the Olympics where we had uh, Olga Corbett and Nadia Komanich. Okay. And I'm sure I was one of millions of other little girls at that time that watched that. And, and then a the term I use is called source inspiration and in, in an ignition phase. For someone, when you are inspired by what someone else does, that can cause a really significant shift in your life. I didn't know it so succinctly in that way at that time, but it launched me into this really incredible phase of my life. 
that um, really was about developing mental discipline. Um, and I would just have to visualize and see these little routines that they had done. And that became my source inspiration. And I went to extremely far lengths to, to become like these two people that I idolized. And so I acquired really kind of over the top mental disciplines that I, how do you account for that? And I call it source inspiration. It was just this being inspired by someone else. So never discount the power of uh, the need, the human element of inspiration and, the, and of allowing that to help forge you. <clears throat> so out of that, um, I, I just, it was just insane. I, I can't even spell out how dedicated, probably the most extreme is I wanted to learn the straddle splits. And I, I put in three hours a day on that endeavor alone. Just that aspect, because flexibility is one component, then there's strength, et cetera, coordination. But just that, you kind of got to go just a little flip on mindset. And so when I look back at what helped me in my disciplines, it was that era of my life, which was spanned, uh, I then became a sports coach for 15 years. So out of that was mental disciplines, but I also acquired the skill of tracking. And yes, that's a skill. It's a mental discipline. I would chart out everything, how many push-ups, how many pull-ups, da -da -da -da, and I would check them up, check them up, check them up, check them up. That tracked and tied into paid advertising, into phone dials, consultative selling, the whole nine yards was I knew that when I tracked, I operated at a completely different, I can tell you wanting to jump in and say some things. Um, I, I'm guessing you're totally resonating with this, but I'm just saying that was really my foundation. And, and I don't know what that looks like to not have had that foundation. That was my early year experience. And I also used, um, when I was teased, my older brothers teased me really fiercely. That made my little inner giant, uh, which Tony Robbins talks about, that inner giant, that inner giant, she kind of, she grew really, really, really big because I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah. I didn't vocalize it, mind you, because this little pipsqueak, but my inner giant rose up out of that. So when people complain about teasing and this and that, I'm like, turn that into, turn that into a motivator. Let that drive and compel you. I mean, I didn't have anything I necessarily wanted to get back with about someone. I just used it to be, to let me grow up into a bigger game. So those are just, um, and then there's a different story about how I got to where I'm at. Oh, just, did you want to say anything or otherwise I'll go into my chronology? No, go ahead. Keep going. Okay. Um, so basically I got exposed to direct sales. Oh, I should have grabbed it for you. If you look on my bookshelf right behind me, see that green, white, and red on that shelf? Do you see those little specks? Can you see that or no? On my bookshelf? Oh, no, I don't hear you at all. Oh, you're muted. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Those are hand-knitted hand Christmas bells. When I was seven years old, my grandma taught me how to knit, and then she taught me how to make those Christmas bells. I wish I would have thought to bring them over. I show those at live events to illustrate a point. My mom, who had sold cards, gift cards, door-to-door -door in high school, she set me up with my very first door when I was seven years old. She gave me this paper box. It's the kind of those gift boxes that they use at Christmas. You can buy them at, used to be Woolworths back in the day. Right. Anyways, <laughs> remember Woolworths? Anyways, um, and then she taught me about how to have change. You know, there were some quarters in there. And I went out in my neighborhood. My mom wasn't with me. These were the, this was the era when the families were bigger and mommies and daddies didn't shelter their kids as much and neighborhoods were safer. So I went off in the neighborhood with my little paper box of Christmas bells that I had made. And I went out and, and I will never forget the physicality of holding that box. And, but the best part is I went out and I was a little girl and I'm ringing the doorbells and I, it's a real simple message. And I even had bundled offers. It was, um, you can buy one for 50 cents or three for a dollar bundled offer. How about that? Right. <laughs> and um, I sold every one of them. You know, they'd smile. Here's this little girl. And I sold them all. And I came home and my box, it had this sound. You know what the sound was? Can you hear it? It was dollar bills and quarters sloshing around in my box. And I had gone out into my neighborhood and I transacted sales 
from my own added value of creating something physical of, of worth that they were willing to give me money. Mm -hmm. That was the start of my sales career. So now mind you, I had no interest, you know, in between that time and then forward, because I had that whole gymnastics uh, interlude there. But so when we got married, um, I was highly committed to motherhood. I, that was, I wanted to be a mom, you know. So we got married, had our first son a year later, and I um, was at a, a parade thing, an event of uh, the High Bridge in St. Paul, Minnesota, and they had a celebration, and there was a gal that if you gave your name and email, or no, email addresses didn't exist, your name and phone number, right? We didn't have emails back then. You could get a free facial. And I became someone's lead. Mm. So she followed up with me and I joined Mary Kay. Yeah, so Mary Kay was my first direct sales company. I was 25 or so, and then I just went through that whole deal. Now, when I decide to do something, it's rarely I do it this way. It's I go all the way, all the way. So I worked really, really hard at it. I was teaching gymnastics at that time. And, uh, but subsequent to that, I did a whole number of um, home party plans. I did, uh, I did Avon. I loved Avon. Absolutely loved it. My boys helped me out. They would put in the little baggy things, the catalog, and then we go door to door. And I was always about, you're going to be part of the family economy. It's not mommy does her separate activity. No, you're going to be a part of the family economy. So anyways, and I did House of Lloyd, Christmas Around the World. And then when things really changed, it was introduction to Robert Kiyosaki's book. I guess I don't have it close at hand. A Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. By this time, I was homeschooling all three of our, our boys. And I was at Barnes & Noble, and his book jumped out. Now, by this time, we had our own, uh, we had several businesses, uh, we did real estate investment. We had our windshield replacement business for 12 years, et cetera. But that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the premise of how the rich teach their children differently than the, the middle class, his little subhead, you know. Anyways, I consumed that and I told my eldest son, you read every book this guy has written. So he was a freshman in high school. And we then went on a parallel journey of just, I've never looked back since. And I looked at the entire world in a very, very different lens because of those books. So my son had many different businesses during that time in high school. And I said, you know, I don't know if you're going to succeed or not, but I will tell you this, you're going to learn something. And I said, at the end of the day, that's all that matters is what you learn and what you take with you into the next experience. So anyways, uh, then uh, when he was 18 and had graduated, he sponsored me into an MLM. So I'd already been in a number of MLMs, more so direct sales. And I really enjoy direct sales. I love selling stuff. I really love selling stuff. It's a blast. So anyways, I joined him in that and I went all out. And uh, it was a nutritional, I don't think I'll say the name of the company, they had different divisions. They were kind of a spinoff of Amway, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, I started to do my health awareness seminars, which I talk about in my book, The Attraction Marketers Manifesto. By default, my nature is always to educate, both my parents were teachers. And so I'm doing these health awareness seminars and I go to then sell and they're lined up 10, 15 people deep looking for advice from me as though I was their doctor. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't credit myself for having created them. I just copied a, a trainer who came to town to teach this seminar. I'm like, I can do that. And I did. And a takeaway for some of the folks listening is I didn't do it purely for the money. I learned it for the skills I was going to develop such that I just put word out. And I had distributors throughout the entire Twin Cities reaching out for me to come and do a health awareness seminar for them so they could sell their stuff. Didn't bother me in the least. And that was time away from my family. But I got really, really good at it. And people would say, well, I could never do what you do, Anne. I thought, no, you, that's where you're wrong. You absolutely could. You just haven't decided that you want to be good at that. I had made the decision, I want to be good at this. So the outcome was I got this all sorts of people asking me to come and do this deal and I made money for them and I didn't make a dime. Didn't make a dime. 
sure laid a foundation though. So um, then what happened is I was really discouraged by I couldn't get the recruiting to duplicate. You know how that is? You're, you know, you're, you're the recruiter, but no one's duplicating. It's like, wait, this business model isn't doing what they say it's supposed to do, which is you teach them and then and they're supposed to duplicate. And I'm just bending over backwards to do everything for everybody. And, you know, you just bring them to me. I'll help close them and all that. Anyways, and then that moment in time when I was at a um, – is a cross line, up line, as they say. And she's giving her advice and she said, you know, you just need to start all over again. And I thought, you know, that's pretty much insane because I don't call people once. I call them five times, seven. Like, no, I've done everything. This is not someone who shirks. <laughs> this is someone who overreaches with the notion that the median isn't gonna get the job done, what they say. And so I drove home very despondent and I came home and told my son and he was about 20 by then and he had since moved on because no one would take him seriously as an 18 year old selling a gig. He says, mom, you need to go online and you find, you need to find out who's your target audience. <laughs> MLMs don't teach target audience. Anyone who's breathing is your prospect, right? Right. So I came into a training company and that's when everything changed. Yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. So you've been, uh, you fell in love with sales since you were like seven years old and you're just going out there and making a difference for people and maybe just a little bit away. I love that. And uh, today you've created this amazing life. Now, let me ask you this question, Anne. If you were to define prosperity and abundance today, um, how would you define that? Oh boy. You know, it's fascinating. You ask that. Um, one thing we do with all our promotions and, uh, I'm, I'm reflecting on the last three months or so, uh, the thank you page is such an incredibly valuable piece of real estate. So I've done a lot of testing on the thank you page because they've taken an action. They're opting into an offer, a webinar, whatever we survey. Now, for many years, I did this, um, uh, what did I call it? The dream casting survey. Where do you want to be? Future cast, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, we put in place this survey, and the third question is, uh, what do you want in your lifestyle? And so we have boom, 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 boom. One of them is fast car and big house. Every single time, without exception, it is dead last at the bottom. Dead last at the bottom. Like 3%, like you know, said they want fast car and big house. All to say in my marketing and when I, my son and I were partners, we never ever once had any kind of marketing that ever inferred big house, fast car. For one, it was a gag reflex for me. When I saw that was, it's just so commonplace. It's like, what a tiresome message. And for me, it's, it's valueless. Not to say a nice car and a nice house isn't a nice thing to have. So when you ask prosperity and what was the two? Abundance. And abundance. <clears throat> you know, I think of what, um, so prosperity, it's, it's multidimensional. And I'm older, so I'm going to be speaking a little more from that perspective, and I'll hope not to get choked up. But you know, I, I've worked really, really hard since I came online. Um, and it's that whole saying about at the end of your, on your deathbed, will you be wishing you would have spent more time at the office and at your desk or more time with family? So for me, prosperity, hands down, is the real wealth is in the relationships that I have with people and in the relationships within the respective industry you're in, which as I look back, I didn't develop enough of, uh, sadly. You know, that is a, a reflective moment because as Robert Kiyosaki says, your, your net worth is determined by your net work. So for me, the prosperity and the greatest um, vehicle towards advancement into reaching goals, it comes through your network. Always, 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 without exception. It is through the networks that you find unique solutions and you troubleshoot, and, you know, but when you're working in a vacuum, 
not so much. You're just trying to use your little cranium. So um, the prosperity is in having those kind of relationships. And like sociologists say, your five closest relationships is the greatest predictor of your outcome what you, how you're going to turn out so it's like who are you hanging around with so um that prosperity and i apologize i should have written it down what was the word again uh, abundance and abundance okay prosperity and abundance. well they're so linked together um so it's having really rich meaningful relationships so like in my company like there is such a uh, we have such um there's you know how in some human organizations where there's friction and uh, there's, um, I guess, the converse of what is called an advancing personality and there's drama queens and all this kind of stuff. We've, we literally have none of it um, in that when you bring together a group of people with advancing personalities, it's, it's just the, like the most, most supreme experience to work with really high quality people that want the advancement of a, a goal and objective, and, and that becomes the cornerstone of the relationships. Um, it's just so phenomenal. I'll say beyond that for me personally, because I had such an affinity for sports growing up and health. Um, health is like way up there because when you don't have your health, which I've had bouts and has, has my husband, Sorry, but it just has such a, a dramatic impact on everything else you do. It, it, it just does, dealing with pain, recovery, et cetera. So I put a really high premium on putting a, a really uh, focused effort into my health. I, I wish it were more. And I think the older you get, the more you have to be conscientious and bank into it. So I guess where I land is... Um, fulfilling relationships with like-minded people and of course family the love into a family and what that gives back to you that investment and and then my health is uh, right there but you know what I find like when I look back at the most meaningful times of my business in the last 12 years hands down it was um, a series I had of interviewing authors because that interplay of exchange of ideas of, you know, again, advancing personalities is so enriching and empowering and filled with possibilities that I think of the positive impact that comes out of that when you're a very solution bound kind of person rather than the focus on what's wrong. It's more about where we can go. Mm. I love that. I love that. Um, in your world today, Anne, do you have any routines, uh, morning routines or evening routines? Yes. Um, the morning routine is, well, there's twofold. I'm going to start with the evening because uh, it's what I teach so much to my community. I love brain science. I have uh, physiology was my favorite class hands down in colleges. I love to learn how we can use our physiology uh, the brain science to maximize what we want to do. So for example, the analogy of the ant brain and the elephant brain or the executive brain and the, um, I'm drawing a blank on the other, but the executive brain is the ant brain. So it's the smaller, it's the cognizant part of our consciousness. Um, knowing that it's really the subconscious where the bulk of the work happens. Mm. And, and when you're schooled on that and you understand the physiology of that, you input more into the understanding of the executive brain, which is putting together clear, concise plans uh, that are date specific. They're, you know, if it's about making money, they're dollar specific. It's so that your plans are, are very clear, right? And so I like to review things before I go to bed. So I have, um, I still am a, a physical kind of person. So I've got this, um, my planner, I, I do it. I like to write it down. It's a different experience. So I write down all my tasks the night before while I'm relaxing in the living room with my husband and I jot them all down and I'm getting my mental game and I'm wiring my brain. So when you're sleeping, your subconscious goes to work. Your body's in rest mode. 
but your subconscious mind is working really hard and it, it's basically doing refiling and stuff. And so when you wake up, you know, I've set my mind to do the job it needs to do without me having to be awake and conscious, you know, I'm sleeping. So that's a, you know, it's like, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm going to put my focus towards. So the night before, um, and in the morning, always, I love to have my quiet time reading in the morning. I wish I'm more, more faithful about a morning walk, but I'm such a wimp when it comes to cold weather in the winter. <laughs> it's really sad. It's pathetic. It is pathetic. I like my coffee in a warm house <laughs> in the winter months. Um, but uh, reading is, I, I grew up in a, both my parents were educators and then they always had book studies going on and everything. And so like when I'm eating, I'm reading. Uh, mm, the bathroom, there's, there's books and stuff. <laughs> I'm just reading whenever I can in the car. I would never want to just sit in a, an appointment waiting without having reading and writing material. Um, anyway, so in the morning is that um, quiet time where I'm reading and prepping my mind. Uh, that's the precursor for all learning is the mindset is that's the fertile ground. So getting the fertile ground where it needs to be. So in the uh, evening, uh do you watch any TV uh, and then do your stuff or do you not watch TV and you're just go, go, go. And then you do your evening routine. How does, oh, that, how does, that, yeah. how does that really work, Ann? <laughs> you're really drilling down. <laughs> I have a hubby who, um, you know, we both work from home. He works for the business. And so it's just very, very wonderful. Uh, it's a dream come true. If anyone wonders if it's nice, I love it. Yep. He does all the cooking. I do the dishes. I like it that way. He wants to use a dishwasher. I say, no, I want to wash those dishes. I enjoy it. It's relaxing. Um, so he likes to watch the news and we like to watch documentaries together. So it is more of this defrag time. And I know a lot of people say, oh, TV is so bad for you and this and that. I am fully aware that the brain goes to a different wavelength while watching. I don't care. <laughs> um, I'm ready to have it go to a different wavelength. Um, and I'm very cognizant of it because my brain is at a, a, a very high level during my work day, you know, decision making processes, writing sales copy and all that. You know, I'm using up a lot of glucose, you know, a lot of, you know, that's where my, my calories are expended is in my thinking. So I'm kind of pooped and drained, you know, mentally. So um, I read in the evening, but it's hard because I want to be with him and he's not as much a reader. And that's just, you know, we grew up differently that way. And so he likes to have a TV on and I really wrestle with it. I want to have a, you know, some kind of a different chair in the bedroom where I could just read by myself. But at the same time, I want to be with him. So it ends up being that I'm being with him and we're, we're watching. A, we love the cooking shows, for example. We love to learn about different cultures and watch and learn that way. So... So to answer your question, <laughs> yes, I watch TV. That's okay. That's okay. Because a dynamic I know that, that I work with a lot of times is Amy loves the TV. So I'll work till like 10 o'clock sometimes. And then she's still watching TV. And I go down there to be with her. And then a lot of times I just get tired and we go to bed together. So yeah. my question for you is, is that your routine or do you make a beeline to do your journaling so that you program or sub, your subconscious? Oh, mind okay. Before yeah. you get the pillow? Oh, oh, most definitely before I hit the pillow. It's in the living room. I have a recliner so my feet are up because here it's sitting at a desk. Um, you know, I just like to have my feet up at the end of the day. And then I'm in the living room and that's the first thing I do is I get that squared away. So he's got the TV on. Me, I'm prepping for my work day the next day. And I, uh, because of my mom's modeling at a behavioral stance, is she was a mega list maker, is I can't exist without my list. It's just <laughs> that's in my persona. And I cannot, I don't know how people make it through life without lists. My husband's not as much of a list maker. And I'm like, <laughs> how do you exist without, like, I, I want to uh, alleviate brain task and put it on the paper rather than me having to remember. I'd rather have my brain working on other things than having to remember tasks. That's me. But 
Yeah, so I do it uh, first thing to get out of the way. And I will admit this thing. So, you know, I man, uh, I have group pages, community, you know, that whole nine yards, and it's kind of a no-no. You know, I'm trying to detach a little bit, but it's kind of a love and on. I, I do love my people, and so I want to, I go in and serve people, and it's like I have a hard time with the boundaries of, the kitchen is closed. I don't have to be serving people right now. No, instead at 10, 11, and there's my husband watching. I'm like, I know. <laughs> but it's, it's this taking care of people kind of thing that I have a propensity for. Mm -hmm. You know, like running the sports gym, I was always very mindful of the taking care of people and everything operating smoothly is uh, part of my mental psyche. Mm. Okay. So I, I don't know that you answered my question. So you, you do the TV time. Do you go to your recliner? And is that when you write? And then what you go in the living room where the TV is playing? Yeah, so I come there in. with him, but you're still doing your thing. And then when you're done and done, you go right to bed, but you don't go to bed until you do your writing. And stuff. It's, it's the writing first, then we'll watch a program together. Okay. Like, I, I'm not relaxed until I've gotten my schedule okay. done. Yeah, that's the clarity I wanted. So writing and then TV relaxation, little snuggles and then bed and a glass of wine. There you go. For medicinal reasons, right? Absolutely. The doctor <laughs> said so. She really did. I'm like, thank you. I love it. Over the years, Anne, has there been a book or a gift that you find yourself uh, giving to people uh, that you work with? I have bought so many books for other people. I buy books for my entire staff. Um, we'll go through it as a book study. Uh, Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. I've interviewed him in the past. I just sent that off to, um, I'm reigniting my TLC program, Trainers, Leaders, and Coaches, where I groom up my trainers. Um, I said, and she's gonna be like my leader of leaders kind of mastermind. So I sent her the Talent Code. Like that book I read and I'm like, he wrote a book about me, is, is what it felt like. Um, I, Simon Sinek books, I've shipped off to people. I, I buy an awful lot of books. If I like it, I buy it for teammates primarily. And then I'll recommend it to my community members. So like, for example, this is one we're going through right now, Clockwork, mm -hmm. and it, which is excellent. And that is really a big game changer. This, we actually have a mini training course on in our back office, Strengths Finder. That's mm -hmm. part of our onboarding process for all new staff members at my company, 8020 Marketing, in that it's not just the book, but then there's the, you take the test, the assessment more so, and it's out of that, we wanna be very mindful uh, when we bring on new folks that we are aware of their strengths. So we're plugging them into a place where they can really shine that they're not just being put into a little thing, little cubicle, but that we're really drawing on their best strengths. So this is, um, my coach had bought this for me like seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So this, this we probably, and we send this to our top level mentorship members as well. And then we have a consultation with them around this book. So this, this one is um, like more referred to than any other book we use. Great, great. Has there been a purchase of $100 or less, Anne, that you've made in the last six months that has uh, had a positive impact on your life? Hmm. Boy. I'm trying to think here. Uh, well, I, I like anything where, when fitness comes through my feed. I want them to retarget me until I buy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I'm like, I'm not ready to buy now, but I'm going to hit like, and then yes, please put your ads in front of me again, because I'll be buying. Um, so I'm a real sucker for fitness stuff. Um, I bought Air Flight. So I know you're probably talking more training products. Yeah, or, whatever, whatever. Oh, okay. Well, that I, I'm just such a, you know, <laughs> there's some cool new fitness thing, sign me up, you know. Uh, so I bought that, which is kind of a silly thing. I always know it full well when I'm buying. I totally get it. It's like, man, you know, it's kind of a silly one. Yeah, well, too bad. I'm going to buy it. <laughs> 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 like I bought one yesterday. It came through my, it was either Facebook feed or email and it was a fitness thing and it was their ebook thing. And, 
And I'm like, Anne, you're going to sit there and you, I think it's 37. You're going to buy this. And, and seriously, are you going to even read this? Come on. And I thought, well, I don't care. I just feel like buying it. So I just feel like buying it. Okay. Already. And so I bought it and it's, um, it's a husband wife team. So it's a little bit intriguing. And so I know people do this as well. You buy because you want it there for later reference. Mm. Do I ever get to it? Sometimes not. In fact, oftentimes not. Um, but I would say uh, it's probably more fitness stuff because um, that's a very high level commitment I have. I'm trying to think of a book that might have come through my feed. I bought a mentor box, but that was quite a while. Alex Mayer, M E H R. It's $9 a month, I think. I've never gone into the back office, not no. once. And so I sell this stuff, so I know exactly the behaviors of people, and it doesn't really matter. It's, it's filling their need as they see their need. But anyways, he's got a big archive there and I interview authors. So I thought, well, that's convenient. But I can't say that it's had a big impact on me. Um, it's probably me going into Amazon and buying books. Like this, this book is having a massive impact on me. And what's that book about? Um, Clockwork is Design Your Business to Run Itself. Mm. And so we have one of our trainers is mentoring our department heads a small group of us, the executives, because she's done it. Uh, she has three automated businesses. So she has the right, if you will, to then come and train my executive team on this. But ultimately, the business premise is that the executive, the CEO, will be able to take a four-week vacation. That's the real test if you've automated your business. Right. Love it. Love yeah, it. so it's real good. So I guess I would have to say it's, um, it's books. Good. Good. Um, let's shift the conversation a little bit towards business success and the human side of life. Has there been a time in uh, when, and maybe it was been in the past where you struggled with your thinking about prosperity and abundance and can you accomplish a goal? And when that happened, how did you crack that nut or push through it or overcome it? It's happened many times, many times. Um, it's been like a war zone, to be quite frank. Um, there have been so many hurdles thrown in front of me. This I'm speaking specifically since I came online. Um, not just, for example, having an AdWords account shut down, which is probably the most dramatic initial get your legs cut out from underneath you moment. You got a big, big team that you've built and you're 100% dependent on the ad flow and you lose it, your stomach falls to the floor, now what? So I've been through it in every imaginable way possible. Health challenges personally, family, business partner, business partnerships gone awry, everything under the sun. And I think the biggest motivator that's really pulled me through, well, again, it goes back to those, the disciplines from when I was in sports, but, um, it's kind of like, well, what's the alternative? You know, what, what's the alternative? And also, when you build a significant business asset, which was twofold, it was the list, the subscriber list, and then my own brand, and to walk away from that, okay? Those two things, and maybe even the biggest driver of all to cause me to continue to climb the mountain is the team that I had put together, unless you've built a really strong team, it is, it's, it's almost impossible to understand the value of a well-oiled team, uh, one that there's no burrs under the saddle, there's no weird drama, gossip stuff, I and mean, just there's none of that. It's just this beautiful organization. That was such a motivator because I think of the dream team that played in the Olympics with um, Scotty Pippen and Michael Jordan, and yeah, uh, was when can that happen again? So I didn't want to, the thought of, hey, letting it go and letting the team, you know, then they would fritter away, they'd go find different jobs, etc., was a really kind of frightening prospect of, would I ever be able to build a team like this again? So between my husband and I, we've made huge, huge sacrifice to make sure we never lost the team, despite the most crazy obstacles 
they're, they'd be quite revealing if I went into them, but like, you know, I can really understand the pains of what a business owner goes through on many, many, many levels. It's not been a bed of roses by any stretch of the imagination. But um, I have this little graphic I created called the Gur Factor. And it's just when you just, you dig your heels in and that's when you really find who you're, or pardon me, what you're made of. Mm. And like when you are being tested beyond, you just never could even fathom that testing ground. And so when I see people go under, I feel for them because I know they're in pain. And so I have a great mentor that can help lift me up as a moral support. If I didn't have someone that I could lean on into, it would be really tough. I have two, it's my husband is I can lean into him and then my mentor who was, who brought me online in 20, uh, 14 years ago. So without that kind of moral support, because I'm not invincible by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> no way. Um, so I think it's those things, you know, these valuable assets and then the team is an asset. Those became huge motivators that to face the thought of losing that is, would be, is pretty, it costs millions of dollars to acquire that list. <laughs> it took a lot of money and work, you know, so to just go, and, yeah. Right, right. How important has uh, meditation and visualization been in your business building process over the years? Well, um, I'm a person of prayer. So I, use, I pray. I'm a Christian. I read the Bible. And so that is my faith. Um, and that, speaking of leaning into, that has been very profound for me. You know, I get it relative to meditate. And, and Christians do they do that. They meditate upon the word. You know, so I do that. Um, but in terms of visualization as well, so I'm reading a specific, it's from Joshua chapter one, I read every morning now. I really like the message, be brave and courageous. Uh, it's repeated three times in this little stretch there, um, is that mental makeup and the fortitude. Um, but more so in the bigger picture of what you're saying there is that need to have a vision of where you're going. If you don't have it, that's really scary. And so through this book, I've been moved more into, it's called the QBR, Queen Bee Role. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the teaching of that, but what I know that aspect is I have to be designing and um, fashioning out that future vision. And so I'm reading a lot of inspirational material in the morning to really get me into that future casting and visionary work. And so I do then visualize, speaking of visualizing, I was talking to my son last night, as I visualize an army, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> Did you watch Game of Thrones? Yeah. Okay, yes. there you go, good. Okay, Khaleesi, she's got her army. And I forget what they were called, but you saw them with their spears. Yeah. I visualize that army and I'm creating that, except they're, they're an army of leaders and leaders who are developed by me with my culture and, and mm -hmm. how I, my, the makeup of leadership that I have and who I attract to me to develop out as an army of leaders that I feel that's where we will be an unstoppable entity because that is bar none the hardest thing to do is to develop an army. That sounds militaristic, I'm not meaning in that way of death and destruction at all. It's just a visual. It's more of freedom fighters kind of a thing. Um, an army of leaders. So that's what I visualize. And they, I think there's a scene in there where they do this with their, their spears. Mm -hmm. and you hear that, that thud. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> I love that sound. And they're very loyal to her, you know? Mm -hmm. And it isn't I want loyalty to me per se, as it is loyalty to the principles that I believe and my life has been fashioned after the principles of how you treat people. I worked at a nursing home. I took care of the aged and the elderly, and I learned what it meant to take care of people weaker than myself. Anyways, all to say, um, my visual is, so that's what I've latched out into in this season, while I'm right now vision casting of 
this massive army of leaders that I want to develop um, that take my message out into the marketplace. Fantastic. I love that. Let's say somebody is stuck financially and maybe they have the belief that they're too old. Uh, maybe they can't change their future. Maybe they've tried to be an entrepreneur, whether it be a network marketing company or, you know, a brick and mortar or whatever. And they haven't had success. They had a little bit of success, so they got a taste of it, but they just like, oh, they're just feel like they're knocked down. Future doesn't look bright for them. What kind of tips could you give that person to have a, brighter vision of what they want to create so that they could get unstuck? I think probably the number one thing they, they need mentally is the emotional support that um, can be in the form of a community that believes in their possibility and potential to do so. Mm. Um, because a lot of the elderly folks are more, you know, in their homes, they're not engaged in the workforce. It's a, I have a lot of older folks, okay? My target audience is baby boomers primarily in this season. It'll be expanding, but by default, we get some older folks and their biggest hurdle is technology, really. They, they just, it's the time in history for which they landed, they're behind the eight ball and there's no discounting that, it is what it is. And it's gonna take them a lot of wherewithal, you know, like what I have found is e-commerce is far, far easier than learning how to do sales funnels online. Mm -hmm. Learning online sales funnels is a pretty darn advanced skill set, um, which is what I've taught for many years. But e-commerce, because of, for example, the Amazon seller app, and it dishes up all the data, and then, and then you read it on your phone, and you just have to know how to interpret it. So we have 77-year-olds who are doing extremely well making some really good money because there are there are methods that mitigate the need to develop to implement as much technology. Mm. So I would say a mentoring community that can support them because they are kind of, I, uh, this sounds cruel and it's not meant to be, they're rejected a lot because, oh, psh, oh grandpa doesn't know squat, doesn't even know how to do X, Y, Z, you know, and they're kind of ridiculed and then right. it's just their time in which they were born in history. Um, and so, you know, the youngsters lose patience with that. But I would say a mentorship community and then a program that actually is doable for older people, it's gonna take them longer. You know, they're gonna need closer help and this and that, and that's reality. So in my community, we have 70 year olds who, uh, uh, Josie was 70 when she started e-commerce. She had already been one of my previous students. She has three automated businesses, completely 100% automated. One is a huge shipping center in Southern California. Well, she's very bright, she's a psychologist. So she's already, you know, she's a sharp person. Right. But anyways, all to say there is hope, but they are gonna have to work. They're gonna have to practice something instead of once or twice like a youngster might. They might have to do it 10 times over. Mm -hmm. Just the way it is, yeah. but it is possible. So never give up, right? I would say so. And it's also when they come alive because now the neurons get to work again. Yeah, That's there you go. Thing. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's move the conversation to uh, funner topics. Let's say you had the ability, and to send everybody a text message in the world tomorrow, even the people in China, about prosperity and abundance. What would that message say? Oh, it's funny you say China, because I've been there twice, and my son lives there. You know, um, the gentleman who guides me most in that is from Paul Zane Pilzer. Are you familiar with him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. love his writings because it's a spiritual dimension of economics. And um, so when you make it in that broad context of global is um, being open to building those friendships and networks that can take you to the next level. Um, to reach out, build those bridges. It, it's just... It's just so amazing when you do that and how the world opens up to you and don't, you know, prejudge, so to speak, is just go in open-minded and you never know what a single, one single relationship can lead to. Hmm. So what would the message say? You know, what would the message say? Um, 140 characters, Ann. 
Yeah, tweet. <laughs> I don't do Twitter. I have a Twitter account, but I don't do yeah. um, Build the bridges into long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I got out of it. Mobile okay. relationships. Um, is there an unusual habit or thing that you love, Anne? I do like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Hubby was kind enough to get some for me. He doesn't buy any sugar, no white rice, white flour, anything. We're pure antioxidant. But he was kind enough to buy me chocolates on my birthday, albeit a small box. But he did buy me chocolate. Uh, so I do, do believe that is a very, very good nutrient for women, uh, for myself anyways. Um, habit, um, I, I do love to work out. Um, I like to, I love to walk. Those are my habits. Those really? are normal there. What's the unusual ones? Oh, unusual. What is unusual? Oh, my husband could give you a good earful. And <laughs> he, could, he could really, uh, oh, maybe it's. Oh, okay. If, if you want to say a bad habit, I, I tend to talk too much. Probably that. I tend to, when I ask other people to do things, I end up jumping in and doing it for them. I have a propensity to, you know, I want thus, thus, and thus, and thus done. And if they don't get it done fast enough, I jump in and do it. You know, because I'm just kind of this doer girl and let's just get it done and out of the way and on to the next thing. I love it. I love it. Is there a mantra that you've said? about yourself over the years to kind of like a self-identity statement or anything like that? Hmm. Um, a little mantra about myself. Oh, you, this one is ridiculous. We had actually had it made into a t-shirt, but it's going to make me sound like a very aggressive person. <laughs> um, because I come from sales and marketing and I'd say, let's go crush it, kill it, and destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we actually had a t-shirt and I had all these older women wearing this t-shirt. Um, it, it was just, um, it's my mentality is just get it done. You know, mm. go out and do it. Mm. Um, so I guess that's one that I, we put I, onto a t-shirt for the community, believe it or not. It doesn't, uh, mean, it doesn't mean I go out with a gun and hunt. I, I'm not adverse to that. But I just It means just... It just means grab right. pull by the horns and get it done. You're very passionate about what you believe and then you want to accomplish it yesterday. Yeah, it, yeah. yesterday would be good. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you, getting to kind of give the insights and your vision and how you're wired. And I know that our viewers here have gotten a lot of information from you and great strategies. I know I have. Uh, so if somebody wants to connect with you, Anne, what's the best way for them to do that? Hmm, probably, I hate to say Messenger, because then I could get inundated, but I suppose it would be Facebook Messenger. Um, my email, my regular inbox gets full really fast and I could miss it. Um, so probably Messenger. Um, uh, my Ansig page needs some work. They could opt in there. It's a podcast that I haven't kicked off yet. But um, yeah, I would say probably Messenger. If they truly wanted to you know, get direction from me, then I could direct them to wherever. I'm, I'm going to be rolling out my book club and that will be ansybookclub.com. But you know, that's about two, three weeks away from right now. All right, well, fantastic. Again, Anne, thank you so much for sharing. My friend watching, I know you got some value out of this. I sure did. Uh, to hear more interviews like this, just go to terrypetrovic.com forward slash mentor. That's terrypetrovic.com forward slash mentors. And we'll connect you with uh, Ann and some of the other uh, wonderful, wonderful people that have shared on the show. Know this, my friend. Uh, you have a choice. Make it a better than terrific day and a prosperous one because you absolutely deserve it. Until we talk again, bye-bye for now.